You are listening to WTUZ Radio Podcast. Okay. All right. Welcome to WTUZ Radio. And today's topic, whoo, ciao. I know we've all heard of this in passing. Um, It's kind of came up for me recently as I kind of watch how the entertainers, i.e. celebrities, are moving with uh, Rona. So what I mean by that is because basically the world, yeah, the world was shut down because of Rona, it really changed the way people earn a living, okay? So meaning if how you earn a living, you have to be face-to-face with the public, that severely limited your cheddar (laughs) or fiat, or if your particular job or profession requires you to be with a group of people, that severely limited the way you earn money. Now, here's the important catch with all of that. Companies at the end of the day, they do not like to take risk, okay? So, when the shutdown was issued because of Rona and, you know, whether or not you believe that was man-made plan, et cetera, et cetera, that's a different topic. And chow, y'all know anybody that's uh, been on the Facebook, YouTube platforms, y'all know that they've been shutting people's stuff down, snatching accounts, et cetera, et cetera, regarding that. So basically, Folks that need to make their money and because of, with crowds or you have to be around a crowd to make your money, companies don't like to take risk. So even when stuff started to quote, quote, open back up, a lot of these big corporations still did not allow their employees to gather in groups to perform their duties. So if you work a quote, quote, nine to five corporate job and you're able to do it what we call remotely, well, guess what? All of a sudden, out of the blue, honey, they start setting up folks, computers, giving them software, Oh, no, you can work from home. That's even those call centers, family. Yeah, even the call centers. To to this day, as I do this broadcast on 1221 and happy winter solstice and happy welcome to the age of Aquarius. Folks that are customer service agents, now they're able to do that from their home. Okay. Okay. Now, these same companies, by the way, had supervisors, y'all can't see me doing the quotations, in place to write people up for being late for work or watching when you went to the bathroom for a break, this, that, and the third. And when people would try to request to work from home, no, you can't work from home because nobody else gets to work from home. Now, all of a sudden, you can work from home. So basically, that was bull crap from the start. You should have been able to work from home all along. But with that said, I'm getting to the point, y'all. You you know I'm long-winded sometimes. With that said, companies, when they open back up, they are not going to take the risk of someone contracting Rona because they were forced to come into their establishment for employment, all right? So they're still 
not allowing people to be on their premises to work. So what does that mean for celebrities? That puts most celebrities in a hell of a spot family. It really, really, really puts them in a hell of a spot. Okay. You know, specifically the uh, movie industry, start watching this stuff closely. Because even new movies that are being released, now you're seeing these movies released on separate I've seen it two ways. Uh, when Rona first kicked in and, you know, stuff was totally shut down, I saw them exclusively releasing the movies on um, kind of like a pay-per-view thingy. Now I'm seeing it now that the theaters are opening back up. And mind you, AMC just went bankrupt. Now they were already on the crust of not doing so well because streaming has literally taken over. So in other words, people rather wait for it to come out where they can either pay for it via stream in their home or just wait until it's available on cable or whatever. So movie theaters were already hurting to begin with. Recently, AMC, which is a huge movie conglomerate, uh, went bankrupt. All right. So now that they have opened things back up, what I'm seeing is how they're releasing movies. You see them releasing it in the theaters, but they are also releasing it. I saw them releasing it like on um, HBO Max or another streaming service. So what that tells me, family, that The entertainment industry across the board, we're talking music already had a big, huge shakeup. We're going to talk about that in just a second. It already had a huge shakeup. Now we're getting into movies. Television has had a huge shakeup and they, it ain't, television ain't done what they shake up. All right. So let's start with the music industry. And I'm going this is all going to tie into the soul contracts. So just bear with me. I'm trying to give a little history as well as talk about uh, where we are today and then swing back around and tie it all into soul contracts. Let's get to this muse, um, the music industry and how it got shook up. All right. So I'm a generational Xer. Okay, so my particular generation, we were the generation that were the MySpace generation, and we were also Napster. So anybody that's a Gen X, you should know what that Napster is. For those of my millennials and my Zs, Napster was the first music streaming. Okay, it was pre-Apple. Okay, so what happened was (laughs) Napster was started by some dude, some programmer dude. I would have to dig up his name or you you can go dig up dude's name uh, yourself, where he basically uh, put up a site where people could share file content. So meaning if you bought the Prince album. All right, <clears throat> whichever one it was, you wanted to load the Prince album. You loaded your your files from your CD. You dragged your little files onto his particular site. Then anybody else on the site could listen to that file or download that file. So you see the problem that this started to create, right? So basically, what was the point of anyone going and buying a whole quote, quote, Prince CD if I could go to Napster and just download it or listen to it for free? So this started to shake up the music industry big time because people weren't going in buying 
albums, okay? Now, if you back it up even further than that, the music industry always had a problem with trying to get each individual to buy these particular um, albums. We call them albums. So let me back up for my millennials. Millennials, you may know this. My Generation Zs and Ys. All right, beloves. Albums, what we call an album, you had that particular artist had to put out a collection of songs. So, for example, Prince, Purple Rain. That was an entire album. He had different collections of songs on that. Um, When Doves Cry, Purple Rain, Darling Nikki, Child, I Can't Remember the Rest, okay? So usually, at a minimum, I think they had eight individual songs on there, all right? (laughs) So you would buy what we call an album. Now, sometimes... Like in my mom's in them day, it wasn't too much in my day that they would put out singles on the vinyl records, and I think they call them 45s. So, for example, in the Prince uh, example, the hit would definitely be a 45 because they could be able to sell a lot of those. So, let's say Purple Rain would be on side A of it, of the 45. It's a smaller record. You could flip it over, and we call that the B-side. Ooh, child, I'm dating myself, but that's okay. You flip it over on the B-side, and let's say uh, Darling Nikki. It wasn't as popular, but that was a way to introduce that particular single, okay? All right, so when they started coming out with recording devices, so personal recording devices, Then what you could do is put in a cassette tape and record from the album or the 45 or check this out off of the radio or to your cassette tape. Okay, so that's even how the concept of I know uh, my millennials and my Z's, you all heard of what's called um, underground mixtapes. Well, that's where they get the concept from, because my particular generation, when we had the recording devices, and I remember the, when the recording devices first came out, child, I was a, a young girl. I got it as a Christmas gift. Oh, I was about nine or 10. Oh, child, I was so happy. I would go around recording myself. Ooh, maybe that's why I'm interested in radio and podcasting today. Damn, just thought about it. Well, anyway, so I would go around recording myself, go around recording my brothers, interviewing them, my parents, and then I learned, hey, I can record music. So I would literally press record and play, put it up to the radio, turn it up, record my music, okay? Then I got into the teenage years. They came up with something called boom box. Now, what used to be offensive to me when I would hear Caucasian people say ghetto blasters, that shit used to piss me off. But anyhow, <clears throat> they were this uh, great big, really radio, portable radio that you could carry. And whew, child, that thing was... You, I've seen little ones. I had a medium-sized one, but then you also had the big ones. Uh, They came with a cord that you can plug in the wall, but you can also put D batteries. Yes, y'all, D batteries. It took a lot of D batteries. And you could listen to stuff off the radio. Now, the smaller ones, the first ones that were introduced, only had one cassette tape. So meaning... You could let the radio play and then record your stuff. So that was us making mixtapes back up in the day, y'all. When the boom box came out, the big one, it had two, two cassette tapes side by side. So child, let me tell you, let me tell you, baby, 
We was jamming back then. Because what you could do is... You could record that fire good, good off the radio. So meaning if you wanted a slow jam tape, all you had to do was wait to the nighttime. And when the fire DJ was playing all that fire slow music, baby, you get your tape record ready. Play, play for hour, two hours, however long that that tape would allow you to record, honey. And it was the front side and the back side. You was good to go. So. You could take that one tape if you had that boom box and now you could record from that one tape onto another tape. So that's how the whole concept of mixed tape started. This is for my uh, millennials, my Z's and my Y's. Okay, beloved, that's how the whole concept of mixed tape started. So out of New York, When hip-hop started and uh, before hip-hop, there was something called house music, uh, which started underground in Chicago and New York. A lot of those DJs would, you know, mix different sounds and all that jazz, come up with nice beats, and they would record their sessions. And it was dance music, very, very popular dance uh, music in the clubs. So they were recording their sessions And then, and this was before those popular DJs were on the radio, Um, you know, folks would either, I don't know if they were giving out copies, I don't know how those early mixtapes got out. Okay, so that's how mixtapes got started. And so when hip hop came onto the scene, it was the same thing. It was, uh, you know, and shout out to New York, all the different boroughs, because they are the fathers of that genre, okay? But they use that same concept uh, of the club music or the house music where these DJs, or then they started calling them MCs, would record their particular sessions and then folks would make it into a mixtape. Now, they got smart about theirs because they would sell their particular mixtapes, all right? This was before hip-hop went mainstream, before hip-hop got big, and quite frankly, it was the pure years of hip-hop, okay? So with all of that said, that's how the um, music industry works. So Napster, getting back up to Napster, so if you can now just have people around the world post their music that they didn't already set up there and bought on this website. And anybody that goes to this website can either listen to it or download it. The music industry started losing a lot of money. I mean, a lot. At first, it wasn't hitting them. But then it started to make sense to them and they caught wind of it. So they were going back and forth fighting uh, with this Napster dude, uh, a lot of legal stuff. Now, the interesting stuff about it, big industry takes a long time to change. I'm going to say that again. Big industry takes a long time to change change because the first time they saw how big the concept of Napster got and the reason why Napster got so big, Napster didn't originally get big because people just wanted to steal music. It got huge because folk was tired of spending 12, 15, 18, $24 for a CD with 12 songs on it when only three of them was five. Really, that's what we had to do back up in the day. If your favorite artist put out three incredible good songs all on the same album or CD, because they went from albums to CDs, You had to buy the whole doggone thing just to listen to them three 
songs and people would be just furious. So that concept from Napster, <clears throat> people were going in just downloading the popular songs that they wanted. Okay, because when you had that CD file, you could drag out just the particular songs that you wanted. So the music industry got word of that. And instead of them going on the head and splitting up that shit off them albums. No, nah, they want to sue, sue, sue again, sue again, shut down, suppress, suppress, block the technology, this, this, that, and the third. But it didn't matter. No matter how much they tried to sue, suppress, this, that, and the third, we stopped buying albums because it was a waste of money. So what was the response to us Gen Xers telling the music industry to go head on somewhere with that bull. The response was Apple Music. That was the response, okay? Now, a lot of the other artists <clears throat> in the music industry's defense, their artists were pissed as well because that was taking money out of their pockets severely. Because the way the artists get paid from those music deals, child, they have to sell so many records in order to become profitable. Because out of every dollar, they may get a couple of cents. Y'all hear what I said? So if I sold $1 worth, I'm only getting eight cents. And out of that eight cents, I got to pay manager, expenses from the record company, taxes. So that eight cent, let's even chop that in half to four cent. And I think I'm being generous chopping that in half. So artists already, y'all, ain't making no money off the riff. So if folks are not buying their music anymore, not only is it hurting the record company because they can't, quote, quote, recoup their cost, recoup their cost for the production and the promotion, yada, 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 this, that, and the third, and the greasing of the palms of the DJs, one, two, three, four, five. They're not making the money and neither is the artist. So the artists were also very much so upset. And don't get me wrong, I am not in any way trying to say that the record companies were wrong for being upset, nor the artists. I'm totally, totally, you're right. You're right. It was taking food out of all of their mouths. What I am saying is, the industry did not recognize the change in trends of their listening audience and the technology behind it. So instead of trying to legally, although I can understand them legally trying to block stuff, they should have been working on, they should have been working on a similar platform to match what their listeners wanted, what their customers wanted. So it took the generational Xers or the people that's buying the music to say, now nah, y'all can go on with that. So they were playing catch up. So they kept the stuff in court legally and then miraculously, y'all can see me doing the air quotes, um, Apple iMusic came out. And that, they say, revolutionarized. It did. It revolutionary the way that we bought music and the way we buy music today. It totally changed the music industry. On to the point, family, that now... Child, artists, that's why you don't see artists 
make albums anymore. Because it's not profitable. So meaning the record industry said, wait a minute, scratch, scratch. That's something to this. I would rather spend initial money on one fire single that I could make millions off of than spend multi-millions making an album that will maybe hit it and that it would be harder for me to recoup my costs because the expenses are higher. Okay, so that's why now when you see a lot of these young artists that are coming out, it is by singles. I don't know too many people that make albums anymore, family. Only time you're really going to see an album now, <clears throat> if it's one of the established legendary artists that are taking their famous hits, and they can put it as a compilation. And or if, you know, multiple artists get together and do a compilation. But for the most part, what they call pop music and even down to rap music and pretty much every genre, maybe with the exception of, of jazz, which that has become its own niche. It's now only per single. All right. So that's just a little history on the music industry. OK, we're seeing this same formula. Not so much of what I just described in the music industry uh, with the history I gave you. But overall, what we're seeing is a shakeup across the entertainment industry on the way Folks are consuming entertainment. So no longer, as we discussed with movies, do you have to go and sit in a movie theater. So what does that mean? That's going to cut out the middleman, which is the actual movie theaters. Okay? Okay. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, even with television, now they're going to have to rethink how they're going to record or shoot sitcoms and even and even movies for for that matter. Okay, because of of Rona. All right, what I am suspecting now. Th this is just Rhonda's. Two cents. This is the way I feel. I don't have no receipts behind this. This is just the way I feel. I feel what they're going to do, they're going to start severely relying on technology to shoot these movies and to shoot these sitcoms. We're already seeing with uh, talk shows that have come back on the air, hell, even game shows, where they have a limited studio audience, and they have a virtual audience. The main audience is virtual, okay? With the game shows, literally the only people that you see on set are uh, the contestants, and that's only a handful of them, and the actual production crew. The actual audience is um, virtual, so what does that mean? That means you need less production people. So a lot of production people are losing their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So technology is going to pick up the slack for the big production that it took to make movies as well as what it uh, takes to do um, sitcoms, game shows, etc. So less <clears throat> production cost means what for the studios? Less cost. All right. So they're going to rely more on editing 
i.e. technology, to put together these shows, all right? So that's going to be a lot of jobs lost, all right? So artists, because of the way they get paid in their contracts, I'm back on music, the way the, the musicians get paid, and I gave the example out of every dollar they may make four cents, you know, eight cents, gross, and then after expenses, taxes, and all of that, four cents on every dollar of sales, all right? So you have to have some heavy-hitting sales. And if you have a horrible contract, meaning if you shit breathe, the record industry charging you for it. You drink a bottle of water, (laughs) they charging you for it. That gross eight cents Some artists have come out. To listen to this episode in its entirety, go to anchor.fm forward slash WTUZ radio. Again, that's anchor.fm forward slash WTUZ radio. And the link is in the description. Thank you and peace and love.